Hi all, welcome back to WGU Live. I am Aaron Silverman, and you are joining us now for our final session at SHRM 2019 Annual Conference here at the Las Vegas Convention Center. We are about to embark on a topic that uh, might seem very controversial, but it's also very, very salient in the workplace today based on changing laws, changing values, and how that affects how organizations are run uh, and how they think about uh, inclusion of, of people and, and, well, substances. So today we're going to be talking about medical marijuana in the workplace. And to be clear, we're not taking a stance on whether or not it's right to have marijuana in the workplace, uh, what should be done, but we're, we're taking an objective standpoint with our panelists, uh, who we'll get to in a second, to provide some clear understandings of why this is important to talk about, how it affects workplaces, and how organizations can best prepare their people to be educated and knowledgeable about what needs to be done to address this situation. So I uh, am very honored to be sitting next to these two gentlemen, uh, Dr. Rashmi Prasad, the Dean of our College of Business, and Jim Reedy, who is a labor and employment attorney with Sheehan Finney. And uh, Jim is, is a very, very knowledgeable man and actually has addressed such media outlets as CNN, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg. This is my second day hosting WGU Lives. To have a, a, a man of your media caliber, not to mention expertise in this subject, it's quite an honor for me, so thank you very much for being here. Oh my goodness, thank you. And uh, I would love it if you could just give our audience a quick introduction to uh, who you are and your background and why, why are you knowledgeable on this subject. So is it okay if I say I, at one point I was a body double for Brad Pitt? Is that right? No. Um, <laughs> I'm a, I've been a management lawyer in my entire career. I uh, do labor and employment law, so I represent organizations of all types and sizes across the U.S. And this has been a hot topic. This being uh, uh, marijuana in the workplace uh, with the changes of the marijuana laws in the last five to ten years. It's a very hot topic and it's one which I'll be presenting on later here uh, at Sherm. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. And Rashmi? Well, I, you, I've introduced myself <laughs> many times, but hello again, uh, especially hello to all of our students and, and alums who are uh, following along. So uh, I'm the Dean of the College of Business at WGU, and one of our priorities is to provide education that's extremely relevant. And one of the challenges of business education is that late-breaking news, laws, um, trends are all relevant to your business education because they'll be relevant to what you do in the workplace. So we're really pleased to have uh, Jim with us today. It's very, very good to have him so that we can help uh, really edify these issues which um, some of you may not realize how many states have legalized medical marijuana, how many states have actually legalized recreational marijuana, but right. it's, it's uh, the majority and uh, this is uh, a, an issue of interest, I would say, to every workplace in the United States right now. Right. And it's not just from an HR perspective uh, in terms of, of just law, but also I think with um, the values of organizations and, and perhaps uh, how they interact with employees, perhaps. No, I, indeed, I think, I think you're quite right. I think that um, we, we're in early days now and I think all the consequences cannot be foreseen, including uh, challenging the very values and ethics of many organizations which were probably set in place decades and decades ago, yeah. if not longer. Who would have thought 10 years ago that we'd be talking today about 33 states in the U.S. that have legalized marijuana in one form or another, uh, 11 states now with, with uh, Nevada, uh, actually uh, um, Illinois joining in, uh, 11 states with recreational uh, marijuana. Where I come from, the little state of New Hampshire, mm -hmm. uh, Vermont, Massachusetts, Maine, and all of Canada have recreational marijuana. We are, someone described recently, we are an island in a sea of permissiveness. <laughs> uh, I like to think of it more like we're in an area prone to secondhand smoke. Um, but the challenge for uh, uh, employers in that state, but employers across the U.S. Are in a very uh, thin labor pool is hiring individuals uh, and 
uh, going through whether there's going to be testing or uh, at the pre-employment stage or during employment and what the standards are going to be for that employer going forward. Wow. Uh, that's uh, actually pretty much addressed that first question right there. So before we continue moving on in, in, the, in this interview in the panel, uh, for, for our audience, we will be taking questions if there's time. Uh, and so if you, if you have uh, a topic that you'd like us to address, uh, any questions or comments, put them in, in the comment section and we will uh, do our best to answer those questions if we're not already talking about the, the subject at hand. You can hash, uh, tweet us or, or uh, excuse me, on, on uh, WG Live on Facebook. Use the hashtag WGU at SHRM, that's W-G-U-A-T-S-H-R-M, and we'd be happy to go ahead and address a question if there's time. And uh, with that, let's, let's talk to Jim a little bit more about uh, what he's seeing in the workplace. Uh, when it comes to, you talked a little bit about the history of the changes with, with marijuana in the workplace. So what are some of the biggest regulatory changes regarding marijuana that HR professionals should be aware of today? Um, like I said, within the last five years, enormous changes, enormous changes uh, with regard to um, the, uh, whether it's decriminalization or legalization of medical marijuana or recreational marijuana. And then, even more recently, the states that have started to prohibit terminating employees for the first positive drug test or pro uh, prohibited asking about marijuana use at the pre-employment stage, the applicant stage, or even testing them. And that goes down to the, uh, the, the, the micro level of uh, municipalities, whether we're talking about Boulder, Colorado, or uh, New York City, where uh, at, at that level, going below the state level, uh -huh. saying that you cannot test for or even ask about marijuana use. Hmm. I, you, you brought up the municipalities, and that, uh, that just makes me think, too, about the differences in, of course, uh, local, state, and then federal governments. What, what's, you know, as the states and, and localities start to change, but then the federal laws still say uh, what, that this is illegal. Is that right? Right. Uh, and marijuana is still a Schedule One narcotic under federal law. Okay. So it's still illegal under federal law. Uh, and uh, so that's the overlay. And it's been that way since the late 30s that it's been illegal, and it still hasn't changed. And it likely will not change anytime soon. But then on a state level, you've got the 33 states that have legalized it in one form or another, and then you have municipalities that have either legalized it or changed the, the questioning at the pre-employment mm -hmm. stage. So for an HR professional, a lot to consider, especially because uh, we've gotten away from just having a, a local business. Now, most companies or organizations of, in, of, of any size would have multiple locations in more than one state yeah. and so on. So, you know, to take, uh, sorry, Rashmi, go ahead. You no, I, was, I was going to ask about, so the, in this overlapping jurisdiction, you, know, you have an employee who is subject to um, employee codes of conduct in terms of employment, then local, state, and federal law. So, if you, for instance, if you're a federal worker in Colorado, or if you're uh, not working for the federal government, but you're with an employer in Colorado that wants to set its own standards and rules, uh, is that local employer uh, are they are they restrained from um, exercising those kinds of standards for, for their hires? So one of the most important things I learned in law school many years ago was an answer to a question like that is it depends. <laughs> and I think it truly <laughs> depends upon if you... So uh, the, the example you gave is someone working for, say, a, a, the federal government. If you're working for the federal government or a federal contractor, it's pretty straightforward. They have mm -hmm. the, the Drug-Free Workplace Act and it's they can test, they can prohibit uh, the use of marijuana and so on. But then the question is, can an employer set its own standards? Well, it depends upon if there are, again, if what they're governed by. If they're a federal government uh, uh, agency or they're a federal government contractor, they have very little discretion in that regard. But if you're in the private sector, uh, depending upon what state you're in, uh, you can make your own uh, make up your own rule as far as whether you're going to be permissive or you're going to be uh, very restrictive. And um, but it then depends upon the state. And the state laws are evolving rapidly. Right. So state law, take the scenario of, of uh, a state in which you cannot ask an employee uh, to disclose. Then does state law then override that employer, especially if it's a, local, if it's a locally based employer, so, private employer? So the, the, the employer would have to comply with the uh, state or local law. That's right. 
And so, um, and that brings up a very interesting question between the federal government and the state government and what controls. And the, the Trump administration, as they came in, they said, we're going to take a new look at enforcing federal drug laws. But that hasn't happened. Hasn't happened. That hasn't happened. So it's been more permissive, basically saying, if your state law follows certain guidelines, then we'll, we'll I'll let you alone effectively. Okay. Uh, so for, for the HR professionals, the practitioners that, that are here at Sherman across the country, uh, those professionals and the employers have historically utilized that zero tolerance drug policy. I think we were just joined by our, by our, our mascot, Sage, weren't we? Well, Sage, Sage <laughs> is, is, is a very curious owl. Very and wants, curious. And wants to stay abreast of these critical issues. Right, right. right. Of course. Always, uh, Sage is, is curious and wise and wants to remain abreast of all the most relevant knowledge Absolutely. happening. Uh, so, when it comes to the zero tolerance drug policy and the changes in law and attitudes, uh, what are your thoughts for HR pros on continuing to use that type of policy, that zero type of policy, in today's environment? I think, generally speaking, zero tolerance uh, is, is going the way of uh, the policies that are outdated, effectively. Yeah. Um, again, you look at the majority of states that have, have legalized in one form or another, doesn't make sense anymore. Unless you're in a very restrictive environment, like the federal government, or Department of Transportation, DOT, or FAA, uh, and the like, uh, unless the, that applies, um, Zero tolerance doesn't make a great deal of sense. Yeah. So where zero, zero tolerance makes sense principally is in safety sensitive positions. And that would make perfect sense. If someone's, uh, again, driving a bus or a truck interstate yeah. and the like, that makes perfect sense. But otherwise, zero tolerance doesn't make sense, especially in an era where we have very low unemployment. Okay. Well, indeed, that's the other angle. In fact, I think in many of our discussions, in many of the, the uh, Sherm sessions, the 3.5% the unemployment rate on top of that, the skills gap, as new skills are emerging uh, as more valuable and the supply is even less, even worldwide. So that, that is a factor now. The, the employer doesn't have the luxury to say, I'm going to filter out all these employees. You know, you sure. have to work with the labor pool that you have. Sure. Uh, you know, but I, I think back to, you know, before marijuana in the workplace, uh, you know, certainly uh, policies around alcohol consumption and every company I've worked for has always said, you know, what you do in your own time, that's, that's fine. You can go, you can have a drink. Uh, and certainly if I were to, say, get in an accident in a, in a vehicle or at the workplace and was under the influence of alcohol and I was injured, that, that claim, a worker's comp or something, would not be applicable because I was under the influence and that was against policy. Is marijuana policy in the workplace following uh, some of the the precedents set by alcohol policy? I think that's where it's, it's that's where it's going. I think okay. that's where the evolution is going, which is effectively what you do on your own time, as long as you're not impaired. Here's the problem: there's no legal standard for impairment of marijuana. It, it could be in your system if you're a once in a while occasional user or a chronic user, depending upon and how you, your body metabolizes and the like, it can be in there for a long time. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean you're impaired. Sure. But there is no standard, no, no widely adopted standard for the amount of THC in the system. Sure. And I think that brings up a, a, a next topic is that alcohol was never used for something like pain management. Uh, marijuana in the workplace has sounded like historically started with the medical marijuana. I think it, certain policies for the workplace will allow a worker to use a narcotic that is a prescription to be utilized at the workplace. How is marijuana uh, that's used for medicinal purposes being treated versus uh, a recreational product? Well, certainly more states have adopted uh, uh, and legalized medical marijuana use. The problem is the law hasn't evolved to the point where employ employers are required to accommodate it. Under federal disability law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, uh, you cannot use an illegal substance as a reasonable accommodation. However, state laws don't have that same prohibition. Mm -hmm. So there, that, that is we're being set up for that the, the, uh, the next big court case. But I, I dealt with a case recently where a um, a, a worker's comp carrier denied mm -hmm. uh, the use of medical marijuana 
for uh, health care for, for, for palliative reasons or, or curative reasons, and that was overturned. I said, well, no, actually there are, now the question is whether that's marijuana or that's CBD. Mm. And CBD in, is not widely uh, um, regulated by the FAA, and there are questions about that too. But I think that's what we're going to see next, distinguishing between medical marijuana or even the CBD, which doesn't have the psychoactive elements, and uh, marijuana use. Okay, so that could be the evolution. So Jim, um, really the, the way we do the American way, if this were another country, we'd set out rules uh, that, that at least we try to make them black and white, even if they can't be. But in America, we settle things through case law. In the end, um, areas like this where I mean, you have wide divergences between federal state law, you have so many gray areas. Will it take uh, a number of precedent-setting cases to establish enough case law that, that we, we can function on the basis of those precedents? That's where we are now. So uh, you've got the uh, legislature adopts a, a certain law or prohibition. And then you've got the courts to interpret where there's a gray area. Mm -hmm. uh, the early cases after uh, Colorado and Washington State had adopted recreational marijuana, the cases were all in favor of the employer saying, you may use it on your time, but that doesn't mean the employer has to permit it. There were about eight cases in that regard. This, there's a sea change. The more recent cases, the fo four most recent cases across the country have said, but employers, because it is legal, employers can't necessarily use that as a basis to terminate someone's employment because they're using it on their own time sure. and as long as they're not impaired. So we've seen a sea change. I think that's where we're going. And the question is then, are we treating it like alcohol? Sure. So then, how would you advise you know, the typical employer now to be aware of this issue and to prepare? I know that's a loaded, complicated question, but I would think that every, every workplace has got to surface this issue and ask themselves, how does this impact us? I think, I think um, certainly understanding where your, where your locations are uh, and complying with the laws of those states, that makes sense. But also doing a cultural survey. What makes sense for our company? What makes sense within our company? Can we distinguish between safety sensitive positions and other positions? And therefore, are we going to have different standards for uh, different groups of employees? And then from the C-suite down to the loading dock, what's the message that we're going to provide? Because on the one hand, the balancing of recruiting and retaining good employees, on the other hand, protecting the workplace mm -hmm. for safety issues. Real balancing there. Okay. So we have a, a question from, from the audience, and uh, I, I'm going to expand up upon this, this question just a little bit and try and narrow it down. Uh, if if an, an employee is in a state that has legalized medical marijuana, but the employer does not want to recognize that state law, they feel that it's against their value to recognize the law within their workplace. Would a uh, potential employee that is, is being prescribed medical marijuana, can they be disqualified for a job in a state that is legal but that the employer does not recognize? And that's where we're seeing the sea change. That's where we're seeing the cases actually go towards the employee. It's a recognized MMID, uh, medical marijuana identification, and then the person's using it for one person or another. But then it gets down to the, the granular of, okay, what what's the workplace and what's the job? Mm -hmm. Because the employer can say, well, that's fine, but if you're using that substance, just like another prescribed substance, you may be uh, 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 prohibited from performing that job because you can't do so safely. Okay, okay. And, and then, you know, with something like the, the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, how, do, when, how does that intersperse with possible reasonable accommodations in regards to medical marijuana? So, um, it, medical marijuana, uh, marijuana itself is, again, still f uh, illegal under federal law. Okay. And under the Americans with Disabilities Act, even as that statute was amended, mm -hmm. it still says you can't use illicit or illegal drugs as a reasonable accommodation. Okay. Um, but um, I, I, I will bet you in the next couple of years that two changes. Okay. Distinguishing between uh, recreational marijuana and medical marijuana, and even then, if the standard comes out for determining what impairment is. Okay. Uh, so, for an HR professional uh, or a business leader, as this, you know, as 
medical marijuana and, and recreational marijuana become, you know, is, is becoming more commonplace. Uh, if employees show up to work and, and there's reasonable suspicion that they may, might be under the influence of, uh, of a, you know, a medical marijuana or marijuana product, what, what would be your advice in how that professional would respond to that type of situation? So I think if, if the, the casual observation is the person's impaired, and uh, you know, go, go to some of the classic symptoms. So it's lethargic. Uh, I don't want to talk about uh, Dorito stains in the fingertips, but, uh, yes. uh, or the, tell, te the telltale sign, <laughs> or the Grateful Dead's uh, music in the background uh, <laughs> and the like. But if clearly there's a, I, first of all, I would suggest first of all they have a policy that says uh, what their standards are with regard to drugs and alcohol. Uh, second is that they've done training for their supervisors to spot drug and alcohol abuse. A third looking at your state law to say, okay, can I discipline this person or terminate them for this use? Or in like states like Maine, no, I can't. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to send them to EAP and so on. Um, but, um, and then what, what's their testing procedure? Do they have a procedure? And they're not gonna do it in their workplace. They're gonna send them out to a, a recognized testing facility and use a medical review officer and the like. Um, but the biggest issue there is making certain that their, their, their policy makes sense for their workplace. Yeah. They don't just take something off the internet. They don't take an outdated policy. They have something that's up to date that reflects who they are, the laws that apply to them, and that they take a practical approach to it. Um, my personal view in that regard is, if it's not a safety sensitive position, can you save this employment relationship mm -hmm. somehow, um, instead of just to tossing the baby out with the bathwater? Yeah, you know, it, I, I think you bring up a good point. Uh, that it's specific to to the company, and as as we get into the age where more and more services, business services, are provided uh, automatically, uh, a lot of HR technology companies exist where they will provide a small business, a medium sized business, an employee handbook that it's not coming direct from the internet, but they're essentially you know based on the the employer size, uh, what they do, will will cobble together an employee handbook. What, what are your thoughts on that type of service and you know in regard to a but, sensitive but law Aaron, like this? I think if I can if I can interject here, I think sure. it, it, my takeaway from what Jim just said is, you know, good management is still good management and there's no complete substitute nor abdication of good management. You've got to know that employee, understand the full context, and then deal with them in the best way possible. Uh, as you said, hopefully to get them on the path to being a highly engaged, productive, positive employee. Am I correct in your? I, I think I think uh, you not, mean, not well, that not that employee handbooks aren't useful. They well, are absolutely necessary. But well, no, but see, so but this this is the point that that uh, we're trying to make here, which is a good point. Uh, how do you make a good manager? So good managers aren't are, are did, most people are, are promoted to their level of own of their, of their own competence. The, uh, the well-known Peter principle. Right? <laughs> the well-known Peter principle. Yes. So, so this is a very nice segue, Rashmi. What role does education play in developing good managers that have the wherewithal to understand how to approach this type of sensitive topic and the the intricate you know development of say you know a, a tactic like a handbook. Well, my my sh my elevator speech on management is that management is an art and a science and that good managers are highly underappreciated. We've committed a, a faux pas or a mistake in the last many years to derogate management, uh, in other words, to praise leadership by derogating management. Effective managers are people who are essentially the ones who are the great citizens of an organization. They are the ones who have a sense of ownership. They're the ones who worry about the organization seven days a week, and you absolutely need such people. Everybody can't be such a person. So. Uh, I think the bread and butter answer is that we have to keep doing what we do to help develop great managers and that it is, it's an art and a science. So I, I think a great, what a great manager would do would be to understand this issue fully. Understand the issue fully from a legal point of view, but then also from a behavioral point of view. And then think about how to relate to a workforce. Uh, there may be generation gaps at work also. Mm -hmm. There may be... Um, you know, there may be a shift of attitudes that I need, you know, as someone who's 50 plus, um, I need to um, change my way of thinking. My way of thinking may have been frozen in 1980. 
Uh, so I, I, th I think that I think that there's a growth opportunity for all good managers here. But relating back to the handbook, I think that the, that the answer is it, the manager should be on the same page as the organization, and that same page is the the basic rules, perhaps in the handbook, but breathe life into it. But everyone, sh you shouldn't have an individual manager or supervisor who has his or her own fiefdom. They've all got to be on board with Absolutely. HR and the C-suite and so on. It's an evolving topic for sure. Sure, sure, and. Uh, you know, it's, it's a topic that I think that we can continue to discuss for quite some time, as with all the topics that we've, we've had uh, at our panels here at Sherm. Unfortunately, our time is coming to an end, uh, but I, I would ask to end on, on a, a thought from each of you, if I may. Uh, Jim, from your, with your experience in, in watching the evolution of this law, and as well as in your, in, in your vast career of, of how the evolution of laws in the workplace, uh, what's the next trend that you see either with marijuana or with with you know other employment law that HR professionals and business leaders should be looking toward in the in the near future? Well, I think with the with the um, changes in technology, with the changes in our uh, demographics, uh, the changes in our work for, workplace trends, um, being flexible. I think that's the biggest issue for employers, uh, not relying on rigid ways of the past, but truly being flexible being aware of what the law provides, but even within that, um, focus on culture, uh, focus on compliance, but also focus on the best and the brightest and um, and, and cultivating yeah. that within your organizations. Fantastic. Um, and my, my closing thought, Aaron, just is uh, frankly the value of being at a, a great conference like SHRM, sure. where we can meet experts uh, of the caliber of Jim who can start to enlighten us. I mean, in the process just of uh, half an hour or more of of, uh, of conversing with Jim, the, uh, the salience of the issue has risen in my mind, and I've, I'm thinking about what I need to, as a manager, what I need to go back, take back to the workplace with me, uh -huh. and think about, and not just assume that it's a headline somewhere, that it applies to yeah. me. Absolutely, and, and how about from an education standpoint, Rajmi? Yeah, I, well I think it's the relevance, again, where um, WGU is trying to make uh, an impact in education with access, cost, and quality. So the access, of course, whether it's technology or whether it's low cost, you know, whether it is um, ADA compliance within education. So we have our access mission, but um, part of our mission is high quality and high quality in business is relevance. Absolutely. It, it contributes. So again, this is part of our ongoing larger efforts in the college to make our education relevant, Absolutely. to make it relevant to the world that our students actually function, work, and live in, yeah. and not some theories of dead economists. Absolutely. Well, and, and here we are, and we are uh, working to remain relevant, which is why we're here, why, why we align ourselves with uh, with these fine people like Jim and, and the folks at Sherm. Yeah. Uh, I think that we can all say that this has been a very, very fruitful conference. Uh, we've learned a lot from an education standpoint, Absolutely. from uh, through, through policy, through relevancy, and, and we've had a really, really good time on this panel and with all the topics that we, we, we've been discussing. Uh, do you have one thought that you would like to, to wrap up SHRM 2019 annual conference from the College of Business standpoint? Well, my, my thought is I, I would wish that actually all of our students, especially those studying HR, would have an opportunity to attend the National SHRM conference and if not to be engaged in their local chapters because uh, part of your education certainly is the formal part but the co-curricular part yes. is almost as important and it helps you put your uh, learning into practice into action to see it in the world so uh, I would just encourage our not only our HR students but all of our business students mm -hmm. to be professionally engaged with professional societies like Sherm and it's it's quite a show Jim you had some thoughts about what it's like to walk through this this overwhelmingly large uh, expo area. I wish all of our students could could take a tour through this with us Absolutely. and, and will uh, be able to attain that goal someday. Absolutely. Well, thank you for providing those thoughts. Jim, thank you for joining us My on pleasure. this panel. Uh, for everyone out there that, that has been watching over the last couple of days and with this panel, thank you for joining us on WGU Live. Thank you for joining us at the SHRM 2019 Annual Conference. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here and we'll see you next year.